Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome again to our market briefing. A little bit late this month due to some uh, train strikes we had earlier in the month. So thank you all for your attendance on a Friday. Um, and thank you to all of those joining us online today. Today, we're going to be talking about port condition surveys. Uh, this briefing is accredited by the Chartered Insurance Institute and the delegates can claim up to one CPD hour for their participation. We will therefore keep a record of those of you logging on online as well as those of you in the room today. So please contact us afterwards if you require a certificate. My name is Mark McGowan and I'm the Global Managing Director for Maritime here at ABL. And I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for today. Um, for the technical part of our discussion, David Faulkner is a master mariner with river pilotage experience and is our director of our ports and harbours team. He has undertaken numerous navigation risk assessments, marine traffic studies and surveys of port and vessel operations. Joining him in the technical part is Harry Palmer, a chartered civil engineer who recently joined our London office and specialises in fixed and floating object damage. And finally, Jasper Gaskin, who is one of our graduate engineers, will be presenting our case reports from last month. Jasper is part of our engineering development programme and we are currently recruiting for 2023's intake. So if you know uh, any engineers who are, who are keen in, in joining any of our fields, whether that's ABL or, or um, NSC or Longitude or OWC, please do get in touch because we are going to be recruiting for next year. Usual caveats apply, Chatham House rules apply and the information contained in these presentations and any opinions expressed by the presenters are those of the presenters alone and not necessarily those of ABL. At the end of today's briefing, we will ask everyone to take three minutes out of their time to complete our online survey. This is very critical for us as it's an important part of our CPT accreditation status, which we would like to keep. And obviously, um, it also means that we can actively look to improve these briefings to match our clients' requirements and needs. Um, you can download this via the QR code. We'll also send it out, send it out during the follow-up. And for those of you in the room, it's, it is sitting on the desk outside. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to, I think, David's first um, for the technical part of the presentation. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this month's uh, briefing. Uh, today, Harry and me are going to talk about um, port operations and potential risks uh, associated with these operations. Uh, we'll be looking to give a, a high level understanding of the operations themselves before identifying some key aspects of hazards and risks to be considered. As these briefings are CPD accredited, uh, a very important criteria of this is to run through our learning objectives for the day. So in terms of what you'll be learning today, uh, you'll be learning, uh, you'll learn the types of assessments that can be completed to understand port risks. You'll be able to explain the elements of port operation. You'll understand the risk implementation, uh, implications of the domino effect. And you'll understand the importance of uh, safety management versus safety equipment. We'll go over these again uh, once we get to the end of the presentation. So we'll take it in turns presenting the subjects uh, shown on the screen here. Um, but I'll kick off with the first subject, and this is an overview of port operations uh, and what they entail. Uh, we'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have uh, on, on the presentation today, uh, but suggest that we keep those to the end uh, just so that we can maintain continuity through the presentation. So, Port marine operations and ports. Ports are very diverse in their operations for a variety of reasons, uh, such as the cargoes they handle, the location, access, and on site storage requirements. However, the, the two aspects that are, are common to most ports, uh, and these are the onshore and offshore operations. But I should add that to avoid any confusion when we say offshore here, for the purpose of this presentation, uh, what I mean by offshore is that it's not onshore, it's the marine operations that are taking place on the water. So there's obviously the two sides of the operation, but there is an interface between the two. And this is the, the jetty or the berth or, or the quay side. 
and it's obviously here that where the where the uh, transfer of the cargo takes place, and where one op there is the uh, transfer of one operation to the other. So I won't name them all, but I've shown some typical operations for onshore and offshore uh, to demonstrate how diverse these operations are. Uh, you will also see that I've commented um, at the bottom there uh, that uh, on offshore port limits. So uh, the reason I raise that is uh, whilst onshore limits are typically required to have security and therefore fencing uh, and, and quite an ob obvious demarcation of limits, Offshore limits are not usually so visually obvious. Um, it's therefore important that these are clearly defined on nautical charts in order that any marine dangers uh, and or uh, dangers to navigation, uh, vessel movements can be properly managed by the port uh, and people recognize where those limits are. So if we take a, a little bit of closer look on the, on the onshore operations, um, here I've highlighted that there's basically two types of operation, uh, what I would call the dry and the liquid. So for onshore requirements to service these cargo types, they differ quite widely uh, for the reasons I've shown uh, on the slide. Um, basically, the dry operations have significantly more activities taking place on the quay side uh, and adjacent areas. And this will result in, obviously, uh, high uh, vehicle movements and the risks of accidents between vehicles and vehicles and, and pedestrians. There are also crane lifting operations uh, that will result in potentially dropped object risk. And there are storage areas, uh, potentially large storage areas as well for cargo, uh, the transfer of cargo for conveyor belts for, uh, and that type of thing, for instance. However, if we look on the other side, the liquid bursts, uh, they're, they're generally smaller uh, only have potentially pipelines and pedestrians, and there's less physical activity that actually takes place on these jetties. But obviously, uh, when we think about it, that the, the, the cargoes that they uh, handle are, are more hazardous, uh, and any pollution, uh, if there was to be any, would be greater just purely by the volumes that are involved. We can see how these different general cargo and, and tanker port operations can potentially present very different types of hazards and risks. So if we then start to look ahead to consider how port operations may develop in the future, there could potentially be numerous other aspects that we have to assess, as shown on, uh, on this slide here. <clears throat> uh, for example, green technologies are being developed all the time including the use of uh, alternative green fuels. Uh, and then the, the properties of these, uh, uh, the, the fuels and the firefighting requirements uh, are not always the same as fossil fuels uh, and that we've been using today. And therefore the use and the storage of these fuels will require additional consideration when assessing the risk around the ports and the additional safety uh, procedures that will be required. One of the green technologies, uh, and I use green uh, for electricity, obviously electricity depends on how it's generated as to how green it is, but um, the use of electricity uh, and electrification and batteries is, is on the increase. So batteries, electrification, this applies to uh, onshore machinery uh, as well as vessels. Uh, although at the moment where we are with technology, the large battery operation, uh, battery operated vessels uh, are still in their infancy. Uh, but most of us will be aware of the, inc the fire incidents caused by batteries. Uh, and therefore, as these items become more common, the charging, the storage, fire detection, firefighting uh, capabilities will need to be further assessed. Uh, there, there is, uh, however, an increase in the use of cold ironing, and, uh, but cold ironing, for those who are not familiar with the term, is the practice of vessels plugging into the uh, port on shore, uh, the shore uh, power supply and shutting down their onboard generators. That is becoming more uh, common these days, uh, and that uh, technology is being developed. Uh, in addition, also, we have also additional um, uh, sorry, virtual aids to navigation. Um, and these are increasing uh, whereby 
traditional physical boys uh, are being replaced or can be replaced by images that show up on a vessel's electronic bridge equipment. So the signals for these virtual aids are usually transmitted by the port authority, uh, and it's usually their responsibility for maintenance, uh, mind you, uh, uh, as are the physical boys, of course, but there is a change of emphasis uh, for the technology required to run the virtual system. So the Los Angeles Pier of Robots, as it's called, is shown in the top right um, picture you could see there. Uh, and this shows how the Container Terminal Operating System, or TOS, of the future are being developed and are being used in several ports already around the world. In these, all the gantry cranes uh, and shoreside plant are automated uh, with no persons required on the jetty. Obviously, this will change the focus of risks to consider, such as the failure of the system, less risk to humans, additional CCTV monitoring, etc. And then connected to the subject of autonomous equipment is the further development of artificial intelligence or AI uh, for other aspects of port operations. Obviously, this is a whole topic of its own and is continually being developed, so it will need to be monitored as to how different uh, aspects progress and their uh, impact on port operations. Artificial intelligence could be linked to things such as vessel scheduling, <clears throat> operation of port service vessels, energy management, remote pilotage, uh, and maritime autonomous surf, uh, surface ships, or MASS. Uh, for remote pilotage, the pilot doesn't actually board the vessel but guides the vessel from onshore or a pilot boat. In these scenarios, the pilot relies on technology and that there is a question of what happens if it fails during a pilotage. What would be the ramifications if there was a casualty? What backup procedures are in place? As with all technologies, it will probably be a few years before remote pilotage becomes a routine operation. As I mentioned earlier, all the above are broad subjects in their own right, uh, and I have mentioned them here uh, at a high level to demonstrate how the direction of future port operations could develop. I would, however, ask, uh, just like to clarify for the record, I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, uh, and so if there are any questions on this, um, I will take those away and give them to somebody who knows more about these subjects than, than I do. Okay, I will now hand over to Harry for uh, port risks. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, so for the next section, I'm going to dive into a few selected risk areas of port operations. Um, the first one I want to talk about is port structures. So port structures and their integrity and condition are one of the more sort of over risks associated with port operations. These structures, by virtue of their purpose, are often exposed to very extreme conditions, uh, seawater, marine growth, extreme winds, weather, and large forces imposed by vessels, cranes, and waves. For these reasons, the degradation that occurs to marine structures is often far accelerated in comparison to those seen ashore. Not only is this degradation accelerated, but it also could be hidden from view. Either the structure could be underwater, covered in marine growth, or otherwise obstructed. Corrosion is an issue for all marine structures. Seawater is a highly corrosive substance and allowances are generally made for this during the design. Uh, an example of how severe this can be, uh, in many parts of the UK, we have a phenomenon called microbially induced corrosion, uh, which leads to what we call accelerated low water corrosion, ALWC. Uh, this is the, um, this is shown in the image with the orange goo, should we call it? Uh, <laughs> which evidence is that ALWC is taking place and essentially it's a bacteria attacking the pile as opposed to traditional rusting. Um, in this situation, you can get hugely increased rates of corrosion up to a millimeter a year, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but a lot of structures that we'd be installing would be say 20 millimeters thick and they would fail at maybe 10 to 15 mil. So you can see that in less than 10, five to 10 years time, your structure could be at risk of collapse. Another example is concrete chloride attack. So this is where seawater causes uh, chloride ingress. This rusts the rebar prematurely, prematurely and swells the concrete, which causes the concrete to pop out or spall, which is the bottom right photo here. Um, if these structures are in poor condition, they're not only 
a higher risk of collapse, but also the consequences of any external forces, such as an elision, are somewhat exa exacerbated. The consequences of failure can be severe, the cost of repair can be very large, and this combined with a loss of use claim can be serious. So another form of risk for our marine structures are somewhat less visible. These risks lie in the incompatibility of the original design of the existing structure for what is being asked of it day to day. Vessel and crane sizes have increased rapidly over the years and existing structures are struggling to keep up. This graph in the top right, or image, uh, shows the increase in size of container vessels and their associated ship to shore cranes since the 1960s. Typically, marine structures are designed for a 50 year design life, but in reality, asset owners will keep operating them for far beyond this. So you can see there, this broadening gap between the vessels and the cranes and the facilities that they're coming against poses a, le a less visible but equally serious risk to port operations. If a berth is designed for a much smaller vessel than it's currently using the facility, there is an increased risk of structural failure as the, as the vessel or crane demands more of the structure than it was originally designed for. Over the years, the original designs of references for berths can become lost or even somewhat ignored, which leads the port at increased risk of damage and even collapse. The most obvious example of this is in the provision of vendoring. As the deadweight tonnage of a vessel increases, the energy imposed on the structure when it comes into berth also naturally increases. Vendoring must be designed to withstand that energy. If insufficient fendering is provided, there's an increase of risk of damage to the structures. Uh, the images shown here are a berth in West Afri Africa, which was designed and constructed in 1948 uh, and still going <laughs> pretty well considering. Um, these arch vendors they're using here are being asked to bolt, uh, berth 120, 130 meter long bulk vessels and are somewhat undersized. The risk here is that with the poor fendering condition, poor, poor fendering provision, combined with a somewhat aged and degraded structure, the likelihood of a routine birthing event causing a serious failure is somewhat increased. It should be noted that the liability for structural upkeep and design of a berth can sit with the port owner, but it can also sit with the operator who may be a leaseholder or concession holder. So beyond the structures themselves, there are various risks, various aspects of port operations that can give rise to risks. The design, provision, and upkeep of the aids to navigation or voyage, um, and the provision of pilotage vary drastically from port to port. The figure here shows the very complex entrances to the River Thames, uh, and it's easy to see how important good aids to navigation are for such complex waterways. How, how these elements are managed will affect the risk of any casualties with respect to vessel navigation. A further element of this is vessel traffic management systems, or VTS, which act very much like air traffic control, and they ensure a safe flow of vessels uh, and information in a port authority's domain. Another thing to consider, tidal constraints and the met ocean conditions. These will also impact your operations. Storm events have made regular news over the past years, and these are becoming more and more regular. And the systems a port has to record and report this weather to either incoming vessels or those already alongside has the capacity to impact operations somewhat. It's also important that this information is communicated with the port side operations, such as cranes or other large plant, whereby high winds or storms can have a serious impact on their operation and leave them susceptible to damage. Seismic activity is another key consideration in certain parts of the world uh, where that risk is high, uh, and certain infrastructure, such as certain infrastructure, such as the ship to shore cranes, are very susceptible to seismic accelerations. So port equipment. Some port equipment is especially vulnerable. Typically, in, in any port, you'll see highly specialist machinery interacting with vessels, other specialist equipment, and also standard road going traffic. Ship to shore cranes or STS cranes are the largest and most expensive pieces of kit in a port generally. They're involved in some quite high profile accidents and are notoriously vulnerable to impact. The video we've got here shows the impact of high winds on an STS crane. Oh, it's working excellent. The crane should have been left, should have been tied down to the key. But in this case, the cranes were left to operate with this squall coming in, as you can see. Uh, and the crane is easily overpowered by the wind and hits the bridge of the vessel. So, 
The design, handling and operation of these cranes can have a massive impact on the nature of the risk posed. Response to weather events is also critical. So halting operations and proper procedures for tie down are key to minimizing the risk of accidents. Port equipment also exerts very large loads on pavements and other structures due to the really specialist jobs they do. Reach stackers and shuttle carriers, which are the two central images here. Oh, this one's still going, it's getting worse. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so reach stackers and shuttle carriers are the two central images here. Really odd specialist bits of kit, but they exert extremely hard, large loads on pavements. So it's quite obvious that any changes to port equipment should be carefully assessed against the capabilities of the existing structures to make sure damage won't occur. As ports look to increase their capacity whilst minimizing their expenditure, it's quite natural that landside areas will be compressed and congested. We should be wary of the, of the compression of this landside operation areas and the risk, increased risk of accidents due to it. So I'm now going to go through a few types of assessments that can be undertaken to understand the risks outlined in this previous section. So being a civil engineer, I'll start with structures. There are a broad range of techniques available to us to understand structural surveys. Of course, a good amount of information could be gained by classic walkover or visual survey, but as I previously highlighted, it's important to understand the condition of the hidden elements of a structure. A traditional method of underwater inspection is diving, which can provide a good first pass, but can often lack detail and clarity and is somewhat subject to human error and issues around turbidity and stuff like that. Recent technological advancements have meant that there are methods of survey which are not restricted by above or below water issues. Side scanning, which uses sonar, can enable a really high resolution picture of the complete structure to be taken, including the seabed, with accuracy that allows a detection of small cracks down to less than five millimeters. Seen here is um, a side scan survey. I'll play the video in a moment. Uh, of the same key you saw earlier in West Africa, uh, as you can see, as we will see, uh, there's an underwater damage that the side scan has picked up and you can accurately measure it uh, and specify repairs without ever the need for getting in the water. So you can see this is something we probably would not have picked up without that technology. Drones have also become somewhat commonplace in many walks of life. And these can be really helpful in surveying hard to reach structures or those with really large tidal variations. Uh, the image in the top right is uh, the output of a detailed drone survey of a facility on the Manchester Ship Canal. Uh, the whole asset can be easily visualized, assessed and tagged in one model and the client can easily, easily track defects and repairs. So <laughs> once an overall understanding of the structure has been gained, it could be prudent to undertake more detailed testing to investigate those issues I raised earlier, such as ALWC or concrete chloride ingress. Concrete core testing can be undertaken to understand the chloride ingress and assess the likely remaining life of the asset. Likewise, we can do bacterial sampling on the marine growth to understand the risks posed by that type of corrosion. The photo on the left here is a collapsed, it's a collapsed pavement structure uh, caused by a sinkhole at Felixstowe Port. So the exact cause of this uh, is not currently uh, known. Uh, a typical cause of this failure though is corrosion of the sheet piles at the front of the key. So you get a hole in the front of the wall, uh, material loses, comes out through the front of the key uh, and you get a sinkhole forming, which can easily go unnoticed. You're, I've known examples of some ports who just continuously carry out maintenance dredging, not realizing where all this material is coming from. It's actually coming from their key. So these are the sorts of tests we can do to uncover some of these hidden problems that develop over time. And we can nip them in the bud to prevent any of these issues, issues posing a risk to operations. So I will now hand back over to David to have a look at how auditing can be used for assessments. Okay, so uh, auditing, uh, again, we'll look at this now for, uh, for onshore uh, initially. So auditing plays an important part of assessing a port's safety and risk profile. 
Uh, it also forms part of a uh, safety management system process. Uh, it can be undertaken internally uh, by the port themselves or externally by a surveyor. There are numerous areas to consider in an audit. Uh, and again, the subject matter will vary depending on the types of cargoes um, being handled. Uh, but the items shown here on the slide provide some further insight as to those that were mentioned earlier for onshore operations. I've also included a, a photograph here um, for the interface, and uh, it's, a, it's a gangway photograph, um, uh, but it shows an example of unsafe uh, uh, access. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you with a mariner background will probably have uh, spotted a few things were with this uh, photograph, but for those of you that don't have that uh, experience, uh, in this particular um, photograph that, that you can clearly see that the, that the end of the gangway uh, is in the middle of a road, which is clearly not uh, good for pedestrian access to and from the ship. It also crosses the crane, uh, the gantry crane uh, rail. So when, if there's a danger that the, that the crane moves uh, and nobody notices the gangway out, then it could knock the gangway. And then as an additional thing, um, that you should have a safety net underneath the gangway as well uh, to, um, as a safety net for, for if anything falls or anybody falls from the gangway. Now, I've, I've shown that as a, an example of what would be uh, apparent for a, a walk away, uh, sorry, a walk around or a survey uh, on site, as opposed to what the port regulations say. So you may look at the safety management system and it says a, a safe access mate must be supplied by the vessel. Okay, that's fair enough. But when you go on site, there is access, but I would argue that that's not safe. So you can see that there is a, a, an interaction between on-site surveys uh, and, um, and written procedures. So, uh, we'll, we'll look a little bit more now. So on the, on the offshore side of things, uh, and uh, just while we run through the, the, the bullet points here, we'll consider, I mean, there's several um, aspects to consider for, for, for the nautical side. So whether the channels are one or two way, uh, turning circles, uh, underkill clearance allowances, um, working with tugs and pilots, vessel priorities, uh, met ocean operating limits. Now, that is an important one um, for something like this as well, for <coughs> if vessels are trying to maneuver when uh, it's above the Met Ocean operating limits. Um, the mitigations of having a VTS uh, and then vessel sizes. So the offshore physical auditing pro inspections are a little bit more impractical uh, usually um, as there's less to see. Uh, it obviously requires um, services of a boat if you want to get offshore and see what, what the condition of buoys and things like that. However, the alternative is to take a qualitative assessment of how vessels are navigated in and out of a port, for instance. Um, and this may require an initial review of the, uh, uh, the SMS and then consider the practical issues of vessel maneuvering, including the items I've already just discussed on the, on the slide there. Uh, to do this, uh, we require a chart, for instance, so the port, uh, maximum principal dimensions of the vessels um, for each berth and channel, and then compare them to safe working guidelines uh, such as, um, such as PIANC, um, that, which is an internationally recognized uh, uh, body for, uh, for, for safety of, of transit on waterways. But I just would highlight the, the last point on here about the uh, larger vessel sizes, uh, as just previously mentioned by Harry a few moments ago. Uh, th this has been an issue for, for many years, um, especially in the last 20 years or so, where the size of vessels has increased substantially. But port infrastructure has not necessarily kept up pace with, with the size of the vessels. Uh, in other words, vessels are being squeezed into ports that were not originally designed for. Um, with length, breadth, uh, and, and, and depth clearances being subsequently reduced. The traffic studies enable us to have a better understanding of where vessels move, congestion issues 
potentially, and areas where there are high risks of an incident. Analyzing historical automatic identification system or AIS data is one of the best ways of undertaking this. And it allows the actual tracks of vessels to be plotted and analyzed. When assessing the changes within a port layout, the port authority should consider the impact of a new facility to existing third party adjacent operations, as well as the other way around. So whether their operations, the new facility will cause a subsequent increase of collision to, uh, to, to, to existing um, facilities. Also ports are, are usually entered or departed via a channel, river or, or breakwaters, which by definition have restricted width and therefore limited access. Uh, as we've all been aware just recently with the Suez Canal, but block channels can cause a multitude uh, of problems and within a port may substantially affect numerous terminal operations and results in, uh, result in the subsequent uh, business interruption claims. So how do we just take over again now to look at the domino effect and how it applies to port operations? Right. So after having a look at some of these, some of the risks associated with port operations, I now briefly wanted to look at some of the impacts by delving into a, a very hypothetical scenario. So failures and casualties are often not the result of one specific issue or risk. There's often a combination of small effects working together and in sequence that can result in a large risk or event taking place. To somewhat, to look at a somewhat exaggerated example of this, let's imagine a vessel coming into our fictitious port. The port has poor, we poor weather monitoring and reporting strategies in place, so the vessel mass is coming into the berth unaware of the strong winds that are developing there. This also means that the port operations team have not had advance warning and the STS cranes are still operating and not tied down, as in the video we saw earlier. The vessel could be moved easily by strong gusts of wind, leading to a somewhat less controlled berthing against the quay. So the navigation is also compromised. The tug provision is not adequate for the size of the vessel and the aids to navigation are poorly maintained, meaning the master has approached far too quickly. With insufficient tug support, the vessel is at increased risk of high berthing velocities. So looking at the structures in this rather apocryphal situation, there has been corrosion to the sheet piles that's been hidden by marine, by, by marine growth. The structures are somewhat degraded and are less able to perform as required and resist these birthing loads. What was normally an acceptable force to the structure is now a force that will lead to a progressive failure, putting a hole in the front of the sheet piles, and we'll have that continuous loss scenario through the front of the wall that we saw earlier. So since the berth was constructed, the, the port has also begun to bring in larger and larger vessels, meaning the fenders on the quay are no longer appropriate for the size of vessel calling. New cranes have been deployed, produce larger, lo larger loads on the structure than was originally designed for. With all these small effects, a scenario where normally a vessel coming into berth in slightly adverse weather could be done quite safely, the case is now that the structure is at risk of failure and various assets being damaged. The vessel's coming in far quicker than expected and designed for, and the structure is already vulnerable to that. The fendering subpar and the elision results, possibly results in a catastrophic failure of the substructure. On top of that, the ship, ship to shore cranes aren't controlled and have been left down to blow down the berth onto the vessel and damaged permanently. Whilst this seems a somewhat ridiculous scenario, all of these minor issues left unchecked have meant that what is normally a routine berthing scenario has instead resulted in a casualty, causing damage to the vessel and port assets and affecting operations. So to finish off, uh, I'll hand back to David to complete the final section. So what do we understand from uh, a safety management system or an SMS? I've listed a few items there, uh, which that it should incorporate. Um, but as a bit of background in the UK, uh, we have the Port Marine Safety Code that applies to all ports. Uh, this code provides general guidance on Port Marine safety, uh, including the requirements to have a safety management system. 
uh, and it was prepared in response to the lessons learned from the Sea Empress uh, grounding in Milford Haven in 1996. While the Port Marine Safety Code is only applicable in the UK, it does provide valuable information on how marine activities should be conducted in any port. In summary, a port, uh, a port safety management system is a system that should cover all port operations and activities, including those onshore and offshore. The main elements of the system usually include policies, port organization, planning, measuring, reviewing and recording of the effectiveness of the port operations. This, this logical sequence of processes allows a systematic approach for managing safety. So port safety management systems are, fund are fundamentally key in establishing how a port assesses and monitors safety. During audits, it can provide an initial indication on the principles and backgrounds of the whole ethos of safety within the port. It also allows the auditor to identify practical areas that may need further investigation when surveying the equipment and operations. The management systems can vary in size and complexity and will, to a certain extent, depend on the size of the port, types of port operations, also the cargoes, the, the handling, and the services being offered. But the basic structure should include the items shown on the slide. Audits of the port should also include discussions with employees, both on the management side and the site workers, on-site workers, to assess their understanding of the management system. The best safety management system in the world would be useless if the employers are not aware of its function, its content, and its processes. In my opinion, I would, I would always commence any audit with, uh, with the SMS, as they will often provide indications of where to look for potential safety issues on the equipment and on-site survey. So if we move to the actual safety equipment itself, and safety equipment is, it covers a, a, a lot of things. Uh, and from this, I'm, I'm looking at uh, how the P, like PPE is used, uh, the firefighting, life-saving equipment, that type of thing. Um, safety guards, pollution prevention, and, and, and such like. So the safety equipment and on, on site activities are the other side of the coin to, to safety management systems. This is where the safety management system is put into practice within the port operations and where the auditor can visually inspect the condition and status of the equipment and how staff go around their working routines. A surveyor is able to process uh, is able to physically access the practical aspects of the operations, not only for the items shown here, but also for the structural elements discussed by Harry earlier on. The last couple of slides provide an insight into how SMS and equipment policies are related and the importance of having them both. The SMS provides the backbone for the safety and risk, whereas the equipment is part of the mitigation. The two are inextricably linked and are both are vital to ensure that a port is run safely as possible. It would be a high risk working environment if there was only one element without the other. And finally, before I hand over, we would ask to give you uh, a few moments thought to the seafaring men and women at sea today. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to consider the mental health issues of those at sea, as this is as important as the physical health. Seafarers, by definition, are away from home for long periods, and so on today's ships, it can be an isolated existence, with few crew on board and long working hours. There are now more and more restrictions on shore leave due to COVID and security issues, meaning that breaks away from continuous time on board become fewer. There have been recent cases where individuals and even entire crews have been detained either on board or ashore for many months for any variety of reasons and some through th no fault of their own. Under these circumstances, crew may become depressed, which can have serious implications 
on how they behave on board with other crew members and in the worst case, even suicide. So please pay a thought for them and look into this and consider perhaps getting your own company to become a signatory. So we've come to the end of the, uh, the technical presentation. Uh, if anybody has any questions. Okay. Um, hello to everybody online, just to answer some questions. Um, so could you elaborate on the difference between climate and weather in context of port condition surveys? Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> Right, um, so you read the question, so everyone heard, yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, difference between climate and weather, uh, broadly, I would say climate is looking at the long-term risk of sea level rise, which we're all quite aware of, and weather is about the day-to-day -day metocean conditions, broadly. Uh, you can easily look at climate um, for port condition services, not typical, it's more sort of a, like a reinsurer's piece of work that happens over many, many years, and you're trying to look 50 or 100 years in advance, whereas the weather you're trying to look at something that's day to day. Um, and another question is, is there a difference between auditing and assessment? Is there a difference between auditing and assessment? <laughs> uh, no, there's no, no real difference. Auditing um, is, is a, a formal procedure for um, uh, going around and, and assessing what's on there. An assessment uh, is, is the same same thing, but the auditing is a is a written uh, is a written paper trail, if you like, and a, and, a, and um, a demonstration of what has been found during an assessment. Uh, and final online question is: Could you please provide examples as to how ship movements might be limited should physical infrastructure be considered vulnerable? If physical, what sorry? Um, should physical infrastructure be considered vulnerable? Um, could you please provide examples as to how ship movements might be limited? Okay, well, this uh, comes down to uh, port operating limits for one. Um, so we've seen uh, that one vessel hit the, hitting the, uh, the gantry crane. So it's important that the port has operating limits in terms of uh, wind uh, and possibly even wave wave heights, maximum wind speeds. So that should be, they should be uh, carefully monitored uh, and also they, sh they should be in place. Um, there should also be a sufficient tug power, a sufficient number of tugs with sufficient power to be able to handle the vessels in uh, a worst case scenario. Um, and, then, and then thirdly, in terms of those, uh, the, in gantry cranes in particular, if we're looking at those, then that is, uh, ensuring that they are stowed properly uh, with the jibs uh, lifted and, if necessary, clear of the berth that, that is being uh, manoeuvred to and from. Yeah, and that's it for all the online questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'll now hand over to, um, to Jasper for the marine uh, casualty cases. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks both. Um, yeah, as Mark mentioned, uh, my name is Jasper. I'm on the engineering development scheme um, and I'm pretty new to the whole marine world. I've had a colleague very kindly put this presentation together. So apologies in advance if I butcher any uh, technical uh, terminology. Um, so the purpose of this section of the briefing is simply to keep you updated on some of the recent higher cost incidents that ABL have been involved in and in doing so, show you or remind you of the sort of incidents and casualties that can happen in shipping and marine operations. But in case some of you haven't attended these briefings before, you might be asking, what are these so-called case reports? Well, these feature largely, but not exclusively, hull and machinery casualties with estimated costs of repair in excess of a quarter of a million dollars, a quarter of a million, yep, uh, usually excluding salvage costs. They cover only a subset of the total ABL group caseload which is typically in the order of around 10%. However, this is an important subset, which represents about 25% of the H&M cases by number and around 65 to 75% of the H&M cases we survey by cost. Estimated costs though are often preliminary and subject to further inspections and slash or investigations. In presenting these case reports for the last month of activity, 
It's not about attributing blame. We just aim to convey what happened. So we won't be given any definitive conclusions about cause, as many of these cases are still fresh. It wouldn't be appropriate to do so. And in many cases, the cause is still under investigation anyway. As usual, let's start off with some statistics. Now, uh, my colleague who has uh, been gathering the data for this month's case reports is very disappointed that he has only been notified of nine high cost cases for October. There should be more, he says. Uh, so he doesn't feel we have a complete picture for October. We'll be working on that internally and get information flowing better for next month. In the meantime, the dark blue columns in this graph show what we have got in terms of the proportional distribution of those nine cases by casualty type. Just one in each of the fire, collision, flooding, and stern seal categories, with the other five being engine room machinery cases. With such a small sample set, you are bound to have the gaps in the distribution that you can see. This distribution for the incomplete set of October cases is being compared here to the distribution of our high cost cases for the whole of 2021, given as the green columns. And actually it follows what is year on year, a fairly consistent trend. For example, ER machinery casualties have consistently dominated the distribution and have accounted for around 40% or so of higher cost cases over the years. Now, here we've added in the distribution of those nine, same nine cases by their total costs. And here you have to be a little careful with interpretation. The distribution can be completely distorted by a single very high cost case and uh, in any of the categories. And that's what we have this month. The total estimated cost for the nine cases is about uh, $7.5 million, but just one of the engine room machinery cases accounts for 62% of that. The average cost of the incomplete set of high cost cases for October comes in at $810,000. This is a bit lower than the typical annual background expected figure that we have seen over recent, an, uh, over recent years of about $1 million per high cost casualty when individual extreme cases of over $50 million are excluded. At this point, we normally go on to look at the developing totals for the year, but we'll leave that until next month uh, when we will hopefully have a more complete set of cases for October to include. Let's move on now to uh, look at some of the October cases in more detail. We selected four of these uh, and each has a nice wrinkle in their stories in the sense that they are not necessarily straightforward in terms of cause, cover, and what actually happened. First up is this 12-year-old products tanker. During a ballast voyage from Nova Scotia to Ontario, regular tank soundings indicated that water was getting into one of the diesel oil uh, double bottom storage tanks below the engine room. The tank was not in use and indeed had not been used since the present owners took over the ship in 2019. So the tank was clean and while well, normally quite dry. The rate of ingress was about two to three cubic meters per day. So the crew were able to pump the water out and investigate. They found that water was getting in through a crack in the shell plating. So apologies for this poor quality uh, double section drawing, but on the right, we can see the cross section of the ship at frame 30, showing the location of the affected tank and the location of the crack, just outboard of the skeg stru structure. The crew managed to install a cement box as a temporary repair to stem the water ingress. Class were informed and a condition of class was imposed and the vessel headed to a shipyard on the route for permanent repairs. Let's follow the footsteps of our attending surveyor as he goes to assess what's going on. Here we see the manhole access to the affected diesel oil tank from the engine room. Inside, we find the cement box constructed by the crew. Note the strange pipes or rods coming out the top. Uh, when I saw this photo first, I wondered what they were. It's a strange angle for pipe work. But when you see that the top ends are not connected to anything, but just wedged against the deck head, you realize that these must be what the crew used to brace whatever rub rubber sealing material or wood they used against the crack to stop any spray of water while they poured the cement. Divers were appointed to carry out underwater inspections. So currently we're waiting for them to arrive and get set up. In the meantime, an opportunity uh, to wander through the ship, perhaps to get a feel for the general state of things. The machinery spaces look nice and clean and looked after. Here's the side of the main engine. 
Likewise, the bridge looks very ship shape. And good to see care and attention being taken with warning notices not to carry out pumping or start engines and so on when divers are in the water. The diving company have set up now and a couple of divers uh, are in the water. Operations are being controlled from this trailer. In the trailer, all interested parties can uh, see the feed from the diver's camera. And this is what they found in way of the problem area, an old epoxy patch over the spot where water is getting in. The divers have scraped the epoxy away along the lines of the welds beneath the patch and found a 400 millimeter long crack in the transverse weld, possibly put from poor welding at the time of construction, which is now leaking again due to the patch breaking down. But you can see that with the discovery of an external temporary patch, the plot has now thickened. This current ingress of water may have older origins. I understand that there is no record of any cracking or repair in this area on class records. Interestingly too, and perhaps significantly, the present owners advised that there were traces of an old cement box at the same location as the one their, new, uh, their crew constructed this time around. This could be an unapproved and undeclared repair by previous owners or crew that had occurred prior to the sale of the vessel to current owners in 2019. Uh, had they too had to stop a leak by constructing a cement box? Had they then externally created an epoxy patch which uh, would allow them to remove the cement box and cosmetically re-weld on the inside, which would be a very low cost repair that only lasted three years? So interesting questions of coverage and who might pay in the end. Coming back from such speculation, proper permanent repairs obviously need to be carried out that needed to be carried out this time. I understand these, these repairs have now been carried out, but I haven't received any photos of them as of yet. Repairs were carried out afloat with the divers using a small sealed plate cofferdam shaped to the contours of the hole around the crack location and held in position by the outside water pressure when water was pumped out of the cofferdam space. This then allowed repairers to cut out a section of the shell plating around the crack uh, and renew with an insert piece, all in dry conditions, with full penetration welding and well testing from the inside. Once completed, divers flooded and removed the small coffer dam, removed the back, backing plates that had been attached to the insert to facilitate the welding, and checked the final weld from the outside. Final painting, though, will have to wait until the next scheduled dry docking. Next up, we have fire damage in an elderly naval frigate that was undergoing a major refit and life extension program. The quantum of damage here at only $375,000 does not reflect the potential for damages that perhaps could have occurred. Here we see, or rather don't see, the frigate in question, all well covered up in dry dock. It was three o'clock in the afternoon and deck longitudinals were being welded onto the underside of a new insert plate in the deck of a compartment one deck up and just forward of the quartermaster's lobby that we see here on the main deck. The welder smelled smoke and went to investigate and found fire in this lobby. The alarm was raised. It was reported that uh, four CO2 fire extinguishers were used in the first instance to try and fight the fire, but without success. The fire was eventually put out by the shipyard's firefighting team using water from fire hoses. Here is the insert plate that was being worked on, seen from the compartment above and forward of the quartermaster's lobby. As I said, uh, welders were welding the underdeck longitudinals to this plate, and so were actually working in compartment below, on the same level as and adjacent to the lobby. Fortunately, the quartermaster's lobby is quite small and there's not much in there. It contains a control panel for starting and stopping pumps and operating valves and equipment for various systems of the ship. There's also a public address system plus junction boxes for low voltage and signaling cables. So there isn't really that much to replace. Probably 60% of the cost estimated here will be just for cabling repairs. Here we are looking, at, uh, looking up at the deck head at some of the, that cabling plus a space heater and other burned bits and pieces. And here is a charred alarm panel. But how could fire have started in here when welding was being carried out in the adjacent space? Well, welding on a plate in one compartment can easily set fire to insulation or equipment in the adjacent space. Or if there are openings between the two spaces, 
Sparks can fly through and set fire to flammable items. All such possibilities could be thoroughly assessed and guarded against, of course. In this case, welding was not being applied to a common boundary, but openings at the deck head were present where the deck longitudinals pass through. These are highlighted. It would appear that sparks or spatter from the welding could have come through here and landed on flammable material. The plausibility of that scenario is reinforced when here, we see the other side of that bulkhead on the far right as we look up at the insert plate above. You can see one of the openings indicated by the solid circle. Welding was being applied between the deck longitudinal and the insert plate in the area shown by the dotted oval. Our surveyor is not very impressed with the degree of care being carried out with this specific item of repair in terms of procedures, permits, preparation of at-risk spaces, and provision of fire watch and mitigation measures. Such concerns possibly extend to the works generally. Good impressions were not created by cables and hoses seen passing through doorways without quick release connections or by the ship's fire detection system being disabled without equivalent temporary systems being immediately evident. This is perhaps a situation where all parties would benefit from a JH143 type review. Okay, next up, we have a nine-year-old offshore supply vessel that suffered a failure to one of her four alternator engines. As the vessel is diesel electric drive, this generator engine is effectively one of her main engines. The failure occurred at around seven o'clock one morning while the vessel was underway in the North Sea with diesel alternators one, three, and four online. At uh, 7.14 hours, the fire alarm was activated, indicating smoke in the funnel casing. This was followed shortly afterwards by a smoke detection in the engine room. The crew were mustered and the source of the alarms was investigated. At 7.19 hours, the bridge power indication screens show that number one alternator had gone offline. Once the engine room was entered, the crew noted that, there, that it was no longer running. The engine looked fine from this side. On the other side, however, they found oil deposits and metal fragments on the floor plates adjacent to the engine and a large hole in the side of the engine in way of unit number five, where the crank case door and part of the engine casing had been broken through by the Conrad trying to escape. You can tell from this photo that the crankshaft is in a bad way. The crank pin is out of alignment and one of the crank webs is fractured. On discovery of the damage, the master alt altered course to return to their home port. Later inspections showed that the engine had irreparable damages to major components the crankshaft, as we can see for ourselves, but also the engine entablature, as well as the elements of unit five. Further damages would likely be revealed when the engine is fully stripped down. The cost of necessary replacement parts is likely to be close to the cost of a whole replacement engine. So owners are looking at both options. So what is the wrinkle here? Conrad or bearing failure is not particularly unusual in the engine casualties we see. Here, the question marks arise over the suitability of the maintenance schedule that was in place. The main overhauls of the, of the generator engines follows the manufacturer's recommended method, which is based on fuel consumption instead of the more traditional running hours. The reason behind that is that the engines are overpowered for the vessel and, that, and they are generally run on low utilization. In principle, then, this should allow the engines to operate over and above the normal running hours in order to reduce maintenance costs. This would all seem very reasonable if it were not for the observation that this is the second time this has happened on this vessel. The first incident occurred back in 2016 and also resulted in a complete replacement of the affected engine. Based on fuel consumption, the affected engine was due for servicing now and was in fact scheduled to be carried out two weeks after the incident. Based on running hours, it would have been 4,800 hours overdue. Thus, the root cause of this failure is still under investigation. Finally, let's look at this one. Uh, this is a nine-year-old handy-sized bulk carrier, uh, which was on the sea passage between ports in the Americas, when a main engine shutdown occurred at one o'clock in the morning. The vessel was fully laden with cargo of wheat on board. The crew inspected the engine and discovered that one of the shrink-fitted joints of the crankshaft had slipped through 25 degrees. This would have messed up the engine timing in terms of fuel injection and firing sequence in relation to the positions of the pistons affected by the shift. Two exhaust gas valves were replaced by the crew as they were found severely burned, 
and the complete set of fuel injection valves were serviced and refitted. Attempts to get the engine working again, however, failed, and the master uh, and managers decided to have the vessel towed to the destination port. This involved six days waiting for the tug, and then a tow uh, of a further four days. Here we see her at anchor on arrival where inspections were carried out. Compared to the previous case, here we are dealing with a much larger slow speed diesel engine. Indeed, one that you can actually climb into. Here we see one of the engine technicians presently dismantling the main bearing keep of the main journal that has slipped with respect to the crank web uh, that his right leg is resting on. Here's that main bearing keep being removed from the engine through the crank case door. The technician has now moved and in the picture on the left, we see a general view of the crank throw of unit two and its conrod. This piston and that of number one unit to the right are out of rotational alignment with the other units to the left by 25 degrees. The picture on the right uh, homes in on the shrink fitted interference between the left crank web and the number three main journal, which can, you, you can just about see. Here's a little diagram of how this crankshaft is put together. On construction, the crank throws would have been heated to expand the holes for the journal. Uh, at the time, the journals would have been cooled, reducing their diameter so that they could be inserted into the holes of the crank throws. When the parts returned to ambient temperatures, the journals would expand and the holes would contract, creating a huge friction grip between the components sufficient to withstand the torque generated by firing cylinders. Closing in further on the web journal interface that hasn't slipped, here you see the positional indicated drill mark that lines up perfectly. Whereas here on the web journal interface that has slipped, you can see the indicator mark split and separated by 25 degrees of rotation. The engine manufacturer's technicians attempted to make a temporary repair to get the engine operational by adjusting the cams on the camshaft to change the firing and exhaust timing for the affected cylinders. However, on examination of the crankshaft, after the testing the engine running ahead and astern, they found that the rotational misalignment had slipped to 11 degrees in the opposite direction, indicating that the friction grip between the surfaces had effectively been destroyed. So, sadly, the possibility of operating on low power until a new crankshaft could be sourced or replacement parts for the existing crankshaft could be obtained was no longer an option. So, as well as a hefty repair bill of several million dollars, it looks like the vessel will be out of service for about six months. The wrinkle in this case is the question of what caused the damage. An underwater survey was carried out at the same time as the engine inspections and one of the propeller blades was found to be bent. Had the propeller hit an underwater or floating object with such force to have compromised the, the crankshaft? No loud bangs or vibrations were heard or felt by the crew prior to the engine failure, which you might have expected if that was the case. So as it stands, I understand that the root cause remains under investigation. So that's all we have time for on the case reports this month. I hope you have found these cases interesting. I'll now hand back over to Mark to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jasper. So just to go over our, our learning objectives again for today, um, hopefully you will have learned the types of assessments that can be completed to understand port risks. You will be able to explain the elements of port operation. You will understand the risk implications and the domino effect, and you will understand the importance of safety management versus safety equipment. Um, because the case reports are obviously still active, we, we don't take questions on those. Um, but if you do have any other questions on any of the technical issues, then please feel free um, to contact us afterwards. Um, and just a reminder that our next briefing will be on the 15th of December uh, here at the old library. Um, and please keep an eye on our, on our social media um, uh, channels for, for more information on that. And for the first time in a few months, we've actually had a winner in our questions for last month. And for the first time in quite a while, that winner is in the room. So, Nigel, you have won. Um, our... our um, our bottle of champagne and because you're here a box of chocolates so congratulations and uh, we will be sending out this month's questions with our feedback form so thank you very much everyone and we'll see you next month